joining us for today's uh, episode in our epic series on um, metaphors we survive by, um, uh, image and metaphor in, in 2020. Um, now, can everyone hear me? All okay, Lorenzo, you can hear me? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got a really fantastic, I want to welcome everybody first. And maybe this is just a moment to say that this is a series brought to us by the Institute for Postcolonial Studies uh, in Melbourne and the Centre for Law, Arts and Humanities uh, at the ANU um, and Swinburne University of Technology, uh, also in Melbourne. And uh, welcome to everybody from those places and from any other places as well. Uh, the, we're going to have three talks today. Um, we're asking people to keep those uh, talks to 15 minutes. Uh, and that should give us plenty of time for questions. If you have questions, um, you can use the raise your hand function uh, or you can uh, let me know in the chat bar and uh, I'll call on you and uh, then we'll get um, the lovely Carlos in uh, working behind the scenes there uh, to make sure that you're unmuted to ask the question. So that's much the same format as we had last week. So um, today, as I said, we've got um, three really wonderful papers uh, that address uh, colonialism and metaphor, colonial histories and metaphor. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Lorenzo Veracini, uh, one of our co-organisers for this event series uh, from the Swinburne University of Technology, where he works in social sciences co uh, school. Uh, and his paper is entitled Colonialist and Decolonial Metaphors. Take it away, Lorenzo. Uh, thank you, Des. So, um, Yves Tuck and uh, Wayne Yang have argued that decolonization cannot be a metaphor. And replicating but reversing the logic of settler colonialism as a mode of domination, a colonizing modality that is primarily interested in the appropriation of land, where land is the primary object of the settler's ambition, they maintain that the only measure of genuine decolonization must be the indigenous polity's ability to reappropriate land. It makes sense. And their argument has resonated with the research and militant priorities of many. Then again, in a recent paper, Taki Gaba and Sara Maria Sorrentino, who is contributing to this series as well, and I look forward to hear what uh, will emerge from our conversation. For them, decolonization must face colonialism's foundational metaphor. Slavery, they argue, is nothing but a metaphor. So how to reconcile these approaches? Um, and this is what the paper does, and it outlines some of the ways in which colonialism as a relationship and metaphor are interwoven, which should not surprise if we consider that metaphor is synonymous with translation and that all colonial relations are by definition constituted through foundational translations across space. So my paper also outlines some of the ways in which decolonization and metaphor are also interwoven. Uh, the aim is indeed to answer whether we can remake the world and ourselves through metaphor. Uh, I had a paragraph um, 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 mentioning everyone who has been um, uh, contributing to an emerging debate about colonialism and metaphor, I'll leave that aside, and, um, and then um, sort of get into my, my, my argument. So we must talk about metaphors and other rhetorical figures and colonialism and its histories and the way we craft our decolonial practices because it is a current affair. And also I wanted to say that uh, the founding statement of settler colonial studies as a field of research, the, the, the field I've been contributing to, was that was Patrick Wolfe's famous quip that settler colonialism is a structure and not an event, which was a metaphor. And its purpose was to translate indigenous dispossession from the past to the present in order to emphasize the current urgency of decolonization. So metaphors are technical devices that enable the articulation of a new predicament by way of referring to past experience. In this respect, colonialism is no different than other predicaments. Um, it is a current affair, also because we inevitably appraise this dispensation metaphoric, especially because metaphor is inherently spatial as it carries over the name of something onto something else, which was Derrida's intuition. And, um, and so is colonialism, a circumstance defined by movement across space. Um, this, this, this has practical outcomes. For, so according to some renditions of colonialism, including that of the United Nations since the 1950s, 
colonialism is literally the blue water that separates colony and metropole. Whereas the British colonialists would talk about a south water fall fallacy when referring to American attitudes towards their formal empire. So the colony is also inevitably defined synecdotically. Uh, colony derives from cholera, Latin for cultivating, which is a synecdoc. It is the act performed in a given locale that defines the whole place. The colony raises the food that will feed another place. For example, in ancient Rome's understanding of colonial relations, an urban setting to which the colony is subjected. The colony is thus less than a place, less than an assemblage of culture, people, and territories. It is an entity defined and understood exclusively by the tradable commodity that it can offer. Exclusively here means both that the colony is defined by what it can offer to the detriment of everything else, and that it offers what it offers to the exclusive benefit of the colonizing metropole. Well, some example, Madeira, possibly Europe's first overseas colony, was, means timber in Portuguese. Uh, Brazil was a particular type of timber. The slave coast was in Western Africa. The fabled Spice Islands were in mind-boggling uh, places, but worth crossing two oceans to reach them. The Gold Coast says it all, and so does the island of Tobago. And then there were the Ivory Coast, the Sugar Islands, and they could go on. Even Greenland was a scenic dock and an advertising device. A Viking entrepreneur called Eric the Red had called it this way to attract settlers who, in his words, would be more eager to go there because the land had a good name. Sometimes it goes the other way around and it is the colony that names a specific commodity. Candy comes from Candia, the Venetian name for Crete. The crusader king of England got some candy there on his way back home and everyone was impressed. China is porcelain that is manufactured in a particular locale. The Marara is a particular quality of sugar but also the islands where it comes from. India Pale Ale identifies a particular quality of alcoholic beverage. It had to be stronger than usual to make it trans uh, transporting it worthwhile. And Cheap Manchester replaced India calipers as free trade provisions replace protective tariffs. Sometimes it is the obstruction to colonial commodification that names the location. The Romans did not bother with conquering Hibernia because it was, as the name implied, a land of eternal winter. The Canary Islands are named after noisy dogs. The Romans did not conquer them either. The Tierra del Fuego, a burning, a burning land, did not look very promising to the Spanish conquistadors. And the Pirates Coast wasn't that promising either. The extractive underpinning of all these metaphorical usages are obvious. Colonies can be harvested or plundered. The colonized people can be taxed, ripped off, robbed, and exterminated. But it is what comes out of them that defines them as political entities. The colony is nothing but a trove of commodities to be mobilized in international networks of exchange to the exclusive advantage of the colonizer. But when the commodity that is coveted cannot be mobilized, like when the colonizers want land, metaphorical usages travel with the colonizers that intend to stay, the settlers. Lands that are to be colonized are virgin soil. Their possession has remained unconsummated. They are unfenced terra nullius, like an unprotected woman can be seen as femina nullius. In frontier circumstances, the land is to be opened up, which sounds ominous. And some colonizers, uh, if some colonizers monopolize the land, other colonizers argue that the land should be unlocked, remove the chastity belt. Moreover, when it is land that is coveted, indigenous policy is shaped by fundamental metaphors. The quarantine that underpins indigenous containment in reservations, the intensive care unit that justifies sequestering indigenous individuals in institutions like missions and boarding schools, and the liberate contagion that underpins assimilationist policy, uh, policies aimed at scattering indigenous families in the wider settler community. Metaphors, however, can also describe the ends of colonial. A colonial process that has run its course is understood as the tide of history, finding against the Yota Yota Aboriginal claimants, Justice Olney of the Federal Court of Australia concluded in 1998 that the tide of history had washed away their native title. This is a very colonialist end of colonialism, but there were other neo-colonialist metaphors as well. A new policy decided upon by the greatest colonial power of all 
was represented as an unstoppable wind of change in the 1960s. On a continental scale, it was called decolonization. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom went to South Africa in February 1960, the year that would become the year of Africa, to convey this metaphor to the members of a parliament stuck with white settlers. They believed that they were appropriately sheltered. They already had apartheid, but also declared a republic and exited the British Commonwealth as a further windbreak. Of course, it was a misleading metaphor for them, and in a sense, they were right. They were not facing the wind, they were sitting on a volcano. They eventually decided to accommodate and, them, uh, and democracy erupted in a controlled fashion a generation later. Today, the German government insists on a very poorly chosen metaphor in order to avoid talking about reparations for the colonial genocide German forces perpetrated in Namibia at the beginning of the 20th century. And I want to thank Christine for, for, for this tip. Um, healing the wounds is to them preferable to reparations, which they feel would be a more explicit admission of guilt and constitute a precedent. The Namibian negotiators have called the Germans out. And I now come to the second part of my paper. The language of colonialism routinely deploys colonizing metaphors, but thinking metaphorically can be a productive exercise. It has inherent heuristic potential and it can support a revolutionary pedagogy. Take what is now called colony collapse disorder. It is about bees and it is serious, serious matter, and it only does not matter if you do not eat food, but it is also about colonies. CCD can help us understanding colonialism's end. CCD happens when the workers mysteriously disappear, when they escape spatially. They leave and do not return. There are no corpses near the hive. The colony's labor power absconds, but CCD is also an especially reproductive crisis. There are stores of food, a queen, but the brood has not hatched. The workers abandon their colonies, leaving behind only young adults. They refuse food. It is a general strike by way of displacement. They perhaps strike out to establish maroon republics elsewhere. The workers, slaves, prefer death elsewhere than life in the colony. It is a colonialism general crisis. Metaphors that spread virally and infect received narratives can indeed have liberatory effects. After George Floyd was publicly murdered in Minneapolis in May 2020, an unprecedented shift in public sentiments accompanied demonstrations organized by the Black Lives Matter movement. It became a global movement that exceeded the United States and Australia also witnessed a spate of well-attended demonstrations in every capital city. Britain did too, and many statutes celebrating colonizers have fallen including that of British slaver Edward Coulson, which was thrown into the harbor, a body of water connected to the blue water that enabled and epitomized his business. King Leopold's statues, he was a genocidal slaver with many million victims on his conscience, were also on shaky grounds in Belgium. And then I have a lovely paragraph on, on, on statues and monuments as metaphors, but I'll, um, I'll skip that and get to the conclusion to stay within the 15 minutes. White people supported the Black Lives Matter movement in 2020. White people did not support its predecessors. It's not just anecdotal evidence. This support has been measured. What can explain this sudden shift in public attitudes? Here is my suggestion. A metaphor can, or rather, a newly acquired ability to translate experience by way of analogy. My suggestion is that the lockdowns that accompanied the COVID-19 pandemic have made many more sensible to the constraints to personal mobility the tension and containment and the concerns for personal safety in public spaces that black people have endured for centuries. This analogy works the other way around too. White Americans are less likely than other racial groups to routinely wear masks. A collective widespread dogged and very political determination to flaunt social distancing measures and not wear protective face masks, especially in the US, can be interpreted as a deliberate and public attempt to refuse being treated like black people a stance that follows the unconscious but very real recognition that public safety measures that apply to all extend to all the structural limitations that normally apply only to racialized constituencies. Strangely, the racial dimensions of the politicization, politicizations of mask mandates has been absent from public debates. This transformation is significant for two reasons. First, Jim Crow measures were routinely uttered in the language of public prophylactics. 
here is as colonialist a metaphor as can be. And second, as anyone who has even only skimmed Fanon's work would know, the dehumanizing experience of racialized blackness under colonialism can be summarized as that of being compelled to wear a mask. This extension of subjection and the potential for, the new, for new decolonizing solidarities constitutes a momentous shift beyond Black Lives Matter and COVID-19, but in the context of a similar argument and referring to the current late neoliberal conjuncture, Achille Mbembe has also described in his recent um, critique of Black Reason, a new dispensation for all with reference to the exp historical experience of colonialism. He notes that now, for the first time in human history, the term black has been generalized. So, are metaphors colonialist or decolonial, progressive or reactionary? The scholarly interpretation of Nietzsche's understanding and embrace of metaphor has extensively faced this problem, but found no resolution. So, I'm in good company if I provisionally conclude that they can be both, and that it depends. Metaphors draw attention to the similarities that exist between distinct things. But similarity is not identity. And as Nietzsche concluded, even perception and language are born in metaphorical processes. If anything, it is decolonization that invades metaphor, not the other way around. And I'm turning um, upside down uh, one of the um, um, things that um, Duncan Young said about metaphor. Um, metaphors can be used to obfuscate and to evasively respond to decolonial demands. They can be used as weapons of oppression. Yet again, attention to the operation of metaphors is an exercise in revolutionary pedagogy that unveils the operation of colonial ideologies, an exercise that may be pursued simultaneously with the retrocession of land that is the focus of Tuck and Yang's rejection of metaphor. The former is also a moment of liberation the moment when we collectively interpret the world so that we can then change it, the moment when we move away from a diagnostic framework, for example, how colonialism destroys, and embrace a prognostic one, uh, for example, how we develop the metaphors that will undo colonialism. We need to know about the metaphors we survive by so that we can craft the metaphors we will respond with. In our call for papers, Des and I have already apologized to Lakoff and Johnson, so I now extend my apologies to Gramsci. Thank you. <laughs> that, 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 that was terrific. And I think on behalf of Gramsci, apology accepted. Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed that. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased to introduce now our next speaker. Thank you for Lorenzo for keeping so dutifully to time, um, as behooves uh, one of the organisers, I guess, but still, that was terrific. Uh, Christine Winter is Associate Pro Professor um, uh, in Anthropology at Flinders University, and she's going to be talking to us about seed time and harvest, metaphors of Christian colonial missionizing. Thanks, Christine. Ah, pleasure. And seed time and harvest is an actual book title by a South Australian missionary um, on, on mission work. I'm not an anthropologist, I'm an historian, and I'm actually a theologian by first training. When I turned into a teenager, my mother handed me the religious book she was given in the 1950s. A Christian guide to womanhood, a path begins. Its motto was reif werden und rein bleiben, to ripen and stay pure. And its first image was the black and white photograph of a cherry tree in blossom next to a walking path. The metaphors were all giving mixed messages. For how can walking a path begin for the tree that is firmly rooted? But even that, Kafka said, only seems so. So when Lorenzo asked me to join in this session on metaphors, I offered to contemplate Christianity and colonial mission metaphors. And allow me to declare right from the start, I grew up a Lutheran, and this is the rant against the ancestors. Fruit and fruiting, actually, is not part of my tradition. This belongs to the Herrenhutter, the Moravians, who sat around the round table so that none of them were master, for they were brethren under one master alone. Their founder, Count von Zinzendorf, noble origins and wealth combined with piety and missionary zeal. Metaphors are noticeably devoid of martial towns, and abound with kisses, flames, poor bridegroom of my soul, and precious lamb of God. 
I learned a lot through the work of Felicity Jens. For example, that the missionaries were instructed to await the showing of the first fruit, the first convert, and the detection of the first fruit was out of their control. This control belonged to God, enacted or rather detected through rituals at the mission headquarters, where the missionaries' extensive reports were deciphered and word sent back to the field to pluck this fruit and proceed with baptism. Trees and pruning, fruit and picking here are metaphors in a periphery centered structure that is more often periphery center structure that is more often in the er, uh, arena of Christian missions described in military terms, namely as headquarter and field. In my tradition, in Lutheranism, uh, that is into seed time and harvest, and rightly so. As in my tradition, Jesus does not wash away my sins. Sin stays. Humans are irretrievably corrupted by the fall. In that first garden, purity resided, and the first fruit, plucked and bitten, was followed by expulsion. Adam subsequently had to labor in the field, cursed by thistles and thorns. And Eve had to give birth without painkillers. In the Lutheran mission, the non hours I researched, it has its headquarters in the region of my childhood, Franconia, northern Bavaria. The majority of missionaries were recruited from rural parts of the region, and I'm mindful that agricultural metaphors would have resonated with lived experiences and nostalgic emotions. I still got to know the small family farms of the region before land reform and economic change replaced them with large monoculture entities leaving only one or two farmers in each village and sending the rest of the former farmers off into other industries. In my memory, a city kid visiting the grandparents, the tasks were all gendered. I'm not sure who tended the apple, pear and cherry trees behind farmhouses, but I'd say the pruning was the task of men and the picking left to women and children. The vegetable and herd gardens were women's domain, as was feeding the chicken and pigs and milking the cows. The cow manure was removed by men, who drove them out to the fields. The men were responsible for plowing and seeding. Harvest time was men's business too, but only since the advent of the harvester. My mother, though, still remembers harvest as gendered and communal. Men were cutting the stalks with scythes. I, I practiced that word, it's very tricky for me. Letting the ears fall into the outstretched arm of a woman who would bundle and bind each cut. At a certain strike of the church bell tower, the women would return to the village making lunch. Another strike shortly later told the men that soup was ready and to return to the farmstead. It is the mission field where seed time is promised to turn into harvest. It has a tinge of patriarchy about it, for seed time is man's prerogative. And the women of the mission were often relegated in its histories to being garnished on the man's main meal. The transformation from blossom to fruit the Moravian metaphors invoke is rather effortless. Wink creatures do the job. My tradition, though, has never was never fond of the Holy Spirit, and did not devise methods like the Herrenhuters to clip its wings or cage it in. My tradition ignored this part of the Trinity and put the Bible, confession books, and the church in the space between the resurrection and the second coming of the Lord. Seed time and harvest is accompanied by labor-intensive plowing of the ground. The emphasis falls on the laborers, the missionaries, the workers in the field, or the vineyard of the Lord, if I'm allowed to add metaphors on top of each other. In the metaphor of sowing seeds, the materiality of the seed or the word finds an image, and language translations are indeed a preoccupation of Lutheran colonial missionaries for their sowing. How, I ask, do they plow and break open the ground, and what is harvest? In the images of Van Gogh, who had for some time worked as a Protestant missionary in southern Belgium, Sea time is an early morning occupation, just when the sun rises, and harvest is marked by black and dark blue at the sinking of the sun. Harvest is death, the end of days. Thus the missionaries, I surmise, 
will never harvest, but will await harvest, sowing so that a field stands full of ears. The mission church is a crowd of white cladded figures staying side by side in need rows. Though in a history of the Hermannsburg mission, hi Warwick, nice to see you, uh, there is the given line, there is the line about the effects of the 1929 drought. And I quote, the missionary stands at the grave of his people. Now, this is the time to digress quickly for me and introduce Deepesh Chakrabarti's metaphor of the waiting room of history for the colonial promise that never eventuates, preparation inflicted for something that never comes. Thus, neither the waiting room of history nor harvest are abstract notions, but entail real betrayals. The phrase the Australian Lutheran mission director used in the early 1930s when he sold out the New Guinea mission flock and abandoned complaints against the administration, for example, was ripe and ready. The New Guineans were not yet ripe and ready for more rights, such as local courts, he agreed. Sitam and harvest, I ponder, are always separated by waiting. The field and its produce is prepared for harvest that never quite yet eventuates until it all, is all ripe and ready. Now follow me to the, birth cra uh, the cradle, the birthplace of the Lutheran mission in New Guinea, the village of Neundetelsau. The founder of the New Guinea mission headquarters devised the task of the seminary there first is providing clergy and spiritual guidance to migrating Lutheran Germans in the 19th century, lest they be lost to other denominations in the new world, become Catholic or Anglican or, ah, yeah? So, its task as a mission training place came second. Now that also responded to mobility. Lewis' theological core was about, I quote, the one church in motion. And that held inner and outer mission together, inner and äußere mission, which is work within the church and work towards the pagans, the heathens. Sigmund Baumann has analyzed modernity's unease about ambiguity. The terms for missionizing in and out are full of ambiguity and the mission's foundation is permeated by a deep unease about modernity. A loathing of lipstick, silk underwear, cinema, went hand in hand with a desire to send Lutheran clergy along with migrants to the new world and to expand their task into missionizing indigenous people around the migrants' new settlements. Strangely but consequently, the missions that grew in the field proclaimed themselves to be either anti-colonial or at least not colonial. Transforming a metaphor of Luther from the 16th century about the two arms of one body, the uh, Corpus Christianorum, the spiritual and worldly arm, Lutheran 19th century theology developed two re-arms that were separate and divided, church and state. They operated unconnected. These metaphors accompanied the Napoleonic and post-Napoleonic era well, and they traveled well into the colonies. It is here that I would like to fast forward to the interwar years and digress again, pondering some of the use of the ambiguity of the words innere and äußere mission, inner mission and outer mission. I spent my 30th birthday in mission archives. I was told in the archives of the Deutsche Evangelische Missionstag in Hamburg, the roof organization of Protestant German missions, that there would be no photocopying of the minute books. Instead, I was given a magnifying glass and left to find my own way through the tightly handwritten pages in Sütterlin. Try that. I was determined to see what there was to hide. And I'm not sure if I really found it, but this is what I did find a selling out of desperate people during difficult times. Between 1933 and 1935, the organizations dealing with the conversions of Jews in Germany sought shelter and assistance. They turned to the Diakonie, the inner mission, and were rejected as members, or as they were not dealing with Christian internal matters. Then they asked the Foreign Mission Board for help. They were refused, as they were dealing with Jews, 
who were neither Christians nor heathens, but a third category, hmm, and therefore outside of the scope of foreign missions. The story of the effect of this betrayal is written up by others. Suffice to say that after the founding of Israel, the German Protestant Mission Board admitted the missions to the Jews in their organization as they were dealing with a foreign nation and were therefore foreign missions. Metaphors have real consequences, or maybe metaphors are eager to please. Inner and outer mission in the 19th century, this is where I was before my digression, where for Lure, the Lutheran founder of the non Dettelsau mission, part of one church in motion. Lure was an omega man, a man looking towards the end of days, harvest time. This is in keeping with others during the mid 19th century. The father of the socialist theologian Christo, Christoph Blumhardt over in Württemberg, Johann Blumhardt, was a kingdom now man. He had a horse and carriage ready in front of his house day and night, so when the call came that the Lord has come back to Jerusalem, he could jump onto the carriage and be on his way. Consequently, a group of Württembergers left German-speaking lands at that time and settled in Palestine in order to shorten the journey. I, in turn, are particularly fond of the Leipzig variation of their pietism that undertook aid to the new city poor and worker education out of the Kingdom Now sentiment. In Neundettelsau, back to Neundettelsau, during the interwar years, Friedrich Eppelein, the mission's fifth director, was in contrast to the founder's Omega outlook, an alpha male, a man of the creation. His theological brethren were the neo-Lutherans of nearby Erlangen, Werner Ehlert and Paul Althaus, who sold out Christians of Jewish heritage in 1933 with clever theological maneuvers. Baptism counted, sure, but God had created the structures of the world, including the state or nation, and what God created needed to be respected. The Aryan clause ruled. Now, when Eppeline traveled through South Africa on his way to New Guinea, the mission field there in 1929, he was dismayed by the amount of race mixing. He alluded to the creation and proclaimed that in the meadow many flowers grow, each distinct, and they should not mix but blossom according to their own kind. Christianity was a subdivided unity, and after all, God had sent his missionaries to convert peoples and not people. Völker, that is, racially distinct groupings where the reality of God where the reality God had created that had to be respected in the process of missionizing. Interesting, these, interestingly though, missionaries themselves were, I quote, citizens of two worlds, another book title, able to move from one culture and race to another. It was the indigenous mission flock that had to stay put on the matter. A thousand years, however, only lasted 12 in Germany and the world. And this argument of the structures of the creation, however, was a dead end, dare I say, and not pursued after 1945. For how, I ask, can the ground be broken and the seed sown if one resorts to the metaphors of a meadow? Or so I thought, until I realized that Volkstum's mission the mission that looks at racialized peoples had been renamed and rebranded with the respectable term of acculturating the gospel and dragged into a decolonizing um, undertaking. To conclude, strange flowers do grow on distinct meadows. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and sorry for getting your disciplinary background so wrong, but um, that was a wonderful and an elegant paper. So uh, thank you a lot for, uh, for that. Um, so we're going to move straight on to our third speaker. Um, Shane Chalmers is a McKenzie postdoctoral fellow at Melbourne Law School, and he's going to be talking to us about metaphoric sovereignty in colonial Victoria. Great. Thanks a lot, Des. 
Um, I'd also just like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from unceded country uh, of the Wundry peoples of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present, uh, as well as to any indigenous people who are with us today. So the question for our panel is whether colonialism is a metaphor. And in response, what I want to consider is how colonialism is not just a metaphor, but rather how colonialism or settler colonialism is really constituted by and operates through a whole web of metaphors. And then Lorenzo and Christine have already teased out uh, quite brilliantly uh, some of these, these are strands of this web. Uh, and what I want to contribute is just a, a very focused uh, talk on one more strand, and the strand of this web is, is sovereignty. So to think this through, I'm going to focus on one specific moment or event in 19th century uh, colonial Australia, in which the colonists of the Port Phillip district uh, celebrated their sovereignty as the new self-governing colony of Victoria. So in the first five minutes or so of this presentation, I'll describe this event, this historical event as it was reported uh, in the newspapers of the time. Uh, and then in the last five, 10 minutes, I'm just going to uh, offer a metaphorical reading of this event, metaphorical reading, along with some remarks uh, on why this reading is important, what it helps us to see. Okay, so to begin with the event, so throughout the 1840s, colonists in the Port Phillip district in New South Wales uh, had been lobbying quite intensively for their district, which was centered on the country of the Kulin Nation, uh, to be granted, to be separated from New South Wales and granted its own status as, as a colony, as a self-governing colony. So in 1850, the Imperial Parliament in London passed what is known as the Australian Constitutions Act. And this act, amongst other things, separated Port Phillip from New South Wales and made it into a self-governing colony named after the Queen, Victoria. So under this act, the Australian Constitutions Act, the new colony of Victoria would have its own governor, uh, legislative council, with authority to make laws, quote, for the peace, uh, welfare and good government of the colony. It would also have a police force and of course the Supreme Court. And then all of this would come into effect in 1851, so a year later. Okay, so when the news of this reached Melbourne in uh, the end of 1850, uh, most colonists greeted it with joy. And uh, Carlos is already onto this great. So you can see here um, on the front page of the Melbourne Morning Herald, you can see the announcement of the news and it's glorious news, separation at last. The long oppressed, long buffeted Port Phillip district will be independent, it's a newborn colony. So the day after this announcement, there was a five day holiday in Melbourne and the main event was a public procession. And at the head of this procession was the, what was called the native police corps, the, the native mounted police, about 30 men on horseback riding in this procession behind the chief constable. Carlos, do you wanna to flip to the next slide? So, this is a picture of the Melbourne procession in 1850. And this is in the background, you can see Prince's Bridge over the Yarra. Uh, and you can see the native mounted police in the foreground on the right of the picture. But it's not the Melbourne celebrations that I want to focus on here. I think more interesting is the procession that was staged about 80 kilometers away in Geelong. What was unique about the Geelong procession is the way that it included indigenous communities from the region, most likely the Wadawurrung. Uh, so there was a prominent Scottish colonist who had apparently uh, urged the organizing committee of the procession in Geelong, had urged that committee to include the Wadawurrung uh, within the celebrations. And the, the Geelong advertiser uh, has an article that outlines the plans for this event in Geelong. And it says that, first of all, blankets would be given to the Wadawurrung for them to wear during the procession. And then after the procession, they would be given a feast featuring this full roasted bullock. And then finally, at the end of the day, the Wadawurrung would put on a, quote, a grand corroboree. And this is more or less how the day unfolded. So a journalist with the Geelong Advertiser who was at the event, he gives this account, which I quote, uh, at an early hour, the town began to fill with people from the surrounding villages. All the shops were closed and the inhabitants congregated in the market square in order to swell the public procession. And Carlos, do you want to flick over to the next slide? Uh, this is a picture of Geelong's Market Square created by Esther Gill in 1857. So this is about seven years after the, uh, the procession that I'm describing at the moment. 
So according to the Jolong advertiser, in the morning of this day, the Wadawurrung walked from their camp on the outskirts of town. They walked down Mallop Street to the corner of this square. Uh, and the journalist writes, quote, in their clean white blankets, their appearance was as imposing as could be desired, not unlike Roman senators. So by 11 a.m., the process procession then began to move. Um, first rode the chief constable with the, with the uh, colonial police, and then came the Wadawurrung. And this is how the Argus newspaper reported this procession as it moved along. Quote, to the delight of thousands, the natives assembled in the marketplace, appearing as dignified, as important, as if they de facto possessed that soil, which they proudly walked over. With spears and boomerangs, they headed the procession, the observed of all observer, unterrified by the thousands that surrounded them and unheedful of the shouts that greeted them. On they moved, with a, flan with a banner flying over them. So there they move, with this banner flying over them. What's on the banner? So, the journalist describes this banner. He says that on it is this picture of a war spear crossed by a boomerang supporting a shield with an inscription that read the independent order of blackfellows. The independent order of blackfellows. Carlos, do you want to flick to the next slide? This is not them. This is the ancient order of foresters in this picture, marching in a much later procession. Um, but I'm showing it because it gives the sense of the kind of banner that I think the Wadawurrung uh, probably walked with, given the descriptions uh, in the newspapers. And uh, I'll give reasons for why I think this in a moment. Okay, so that's the scene that I want to describe. Now I'll present my reading of it, my metaphorical reading. And it's a very preliminary reading, I should emphasize. This is a very uh, new project. I haven't really had a chance to uh, delve into the archives and I haven't had a chance to uh, consult with the Wadawurrung in particular on this research. So I'm just offering this very preliminary reading. So there are of course many different ways in which you could read this event. One way would be to treat it literally at face value as just one great big party. And that's certainly how I think uh, most colonists viewed Aboriginal ceremonies such as corroborees as this mere entertainment. And this is a point that I'll return to in a moment. But what if we read the scene, not literally, but metaphorically? So we usually think of metaphors as linguistic constructs, as literary images created with words. Uh, but of course, metaphors are not only figures of speech, as the dictionary tells us, uh, they can also be figures of action. So when you give your lover a flower, you're not just giving them this stalk of organic matter, you're giving them your love. So we don't just speak metaphorically, we also behave metaphorically uh, all the time, even, and I think uh, especially, when we don't even know it or don't even intend it. And uh, this connects, I think, to one of the points that we were discussing last week, which is the difference between metaphor and illusion. And in the discussion last week, we focused on this distinction uh, between metaphor and illusion. So we focused on the distinction, the difference. But as Lakoff and Johnson have shown, um, the most effective metaphors are the elusive ones. So these are the ones that we no longer even recognize as metaphors. So it is these that really sort of un unconsciously structure, create and recreate how we think and behave. So to return to Geelong, what if this procession is one of these unconsciously enacted metaphors? So the intention of the organizers might have been literal it might just have been to have this nice big party uh, to celebrate the joyous news of, se of uh, separation. And yet they might have nonetheless staged a metaphor. But if the procession is a metaphor, then what is it a metaphor for? And my answer is that the 6,000 bodies which were arranged together in that public square presented a metaphor for the constitution of the new self-governing colony. And this is perhaps uh, an obvious answer, but I think it's nonetheless interesting once we begin to take it seriously, which is what I'll do. So Michael Waltzer published this really uh, interesting article in uh, 1967 on the role of symbolism in political thought. And in this article, Waltzer considers how symbolism is, quote, perhaps our most important means of bringing humans together. In a sense, Waltzer writes, in a sense, the, hun uh, the union of humans can only be symbolized. The state is invisible, he writes. It must be personified before it can be seen, symbolized before it can be loved, 
imagined before it can be conceived. So as such, Walzer continues, an image like the body politic is not simply a decorative metaphor, rather when the state is imagined as a body politic, then a particular set of insights as to its nature are made available. So according to Walzer, we should take metaphors seriously because of their representational power, right? So metaphors allow us to see these opaque ideas like the state in a fuller way. Metaphors bring these ideas to life. How else do you smell love than through a flower? And of course, the state is the same. According to Walzer, the state must be metaphorized before it can be loved, or I would add, resisted. Uh, so just as one does not feel the law in this abstract way, one does not resist the law in the abstract. One resists its metaphors. You throw the flower in the bin. So from Walter's perspective, a metaphorical reading of this procession in Geelong might give us a particular set of insights into the nature of the colonial state at one of its founding moments. Read metaphorically, this procession is a, a living expression of the constitution of the new colony which is to say that uh, the procession can be read alongside the imperial legislation, that 1850 Australian Constitutions Act, the procession can be read alongside that act as itself a legal text, as a constitutional act. Okay, so taking this approach, what does this help us to see in this instance? And I'll just give one example. So whereas the imperial legislation, the 1850 Australian Constitutions Act, was entirely silent on how the new self-governing colony would relate to Aboriginal peoples. The procession made this its main focus. So the Wadawurrung were invited to march in the procession. Indeed, they headed the procession. But it's how they were included, how they're included, that gives us some insight, I think, into the constitution of the colonial state. And it seems that in order for the colonists to recognize the Wadawurrung as part of the colonial body, the Wadawurrung had to be organized in this colonial legal form, in this case as a friendly society. And by friendly society, I don't mean a group of people who are nice to each other. Friendly society is this legal term for a particular type of sort of mutual support organization. It's like a fraternity or a guild. And the, the relevant legislation at the time was the 1843 Act to regulate friendly societies in New South Wales. And this legislation made it, quote, lawful for persons in the colony to form themselves into and to establish a friendly society. Uh, so the ancient order of foresters, the group that you can see marching in the image on the screen, they were a friendly society. Uh, in the Geelong procession, other friendly societies included the independent order of Retrovites and importantly, the independent order of Oddfellows. So the point that I want to make with this is that by including the Wadawurrung in the procession, under a banner that clearly signaled this friendly society, the independent order of blackfellows, they would be included in a way that gave them colonial legal status as a group, but that simultaneously stripped them of their indigenous legal status as a nation. So the Wadawurrung were invited to participate, but these were the terms. They had to take the form of a legal entity that was recognizable or legible to the colonists, and that was subordinate to colonial sovereignty. So as one newspaper reported at the time, uh, the only groups that were permitted to march in this procession were, quote, constituted authorities and associated bodies. Okay, so the Wadawurrung were invited to march, but not under the banner of their nation, the Kulin nation, uh, but under the banner of a body corporate, uh, which to this day is how Aboriginal peoples in Australia are generally recognized as peoples by the state. So not as nations generally, but is corporations, and they're currently constituted under the 2006 Corporations Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Act. Okay, so following Michael Walzer, I think that this metaphorical reading of the procession allows us to see how Aboriginal peoples uh, were being included within the nascent colonial state, effectively as this regulated organization which stripped them of their own sovereignty. But I wanna push this reading further because we also know that metaphors are not just representational, but also constitutive, creative. So Ben Golder has written recently in a metaphorical study of human rights that metaphors can be, quote, jurisgenerative, jurisgenerative. 
So by Juris Generative, Golda means, and here he's drawing on Robert Cover's work, he means that metaphors not only represent the law, but create law. Metaphors, quote, work to compose and construct particular realities of law. So if Waltz's point is that metaphors allow us to see an existing reality in a fuller way, then Golda's point is that metaphors also create new realities. And this is Lorenzo's point and other people's point that's been made along the way. Okay, so this is important because it allows us to see the Geelong procession, not just as this kind of static window onto an event in 1850, but to see that procession as part of the dynamic structure of settler colonialism itself. So the procession wasn't just showing something, it was doing something at the time. As a metaphor for the constitution of the new colony, it was juris generative. It was participating in the creation of a new legal reality, a new constitutional reality. And perhaps this is the link between 1850 and today. So the link between one of the first moments when an Aboriginal nation was included within the colonial state as a corporate body, and today when this is effectively the only way in which the state uh, recognizes Aboriginal nations as corporations. So as a metaphor for the constitution of the new colonial state, the procession not only uh, reflected the colonial state at that founding moment, but perhaps helped to generate the state that we live in today. So I'll finish now, my time is up, but I want to finish not with this colonial procession, but rather with the corroboree that the Wadawurrung staged after the procession at the end of the day. The colonists, it seems, viewed this, cor this corroboree as just more entertainment. They took it literally as entertainment, just natives putting in a nice big show for the colonists. So I don't, know, I don't uh, yet know the meaning of this particular corroboree, uh, but what Aboriginal Australians have taught non-Aboriginal Australians about corroborees such as this one uh, is that they were generally speaking legal ceremonies and importantly, international legal ceremonies. So they were, as Paul Carter writes, quote, site specific and audience specific, intended as vehicles for the renegotiation of black white relations. So if that is also true of the Wadawurrung corroboree uh, in the Geelong procession, at the end of the Geelong procession, then at the very moment when the new colony was expressing its sovereignty, so too were the Wadawurrung expressing their sovereignty. The difference though is that the Wadawurrung appeared to be treating this moment as an important international moment, a meeting of two sovereign nations in which the Wadawurrung were first invited to participate in the colonist ceremony, and then the colonists were invited to the Wadawurrung ceremony, to the corroboree. But the colonists refused, or at least failed, to meet this way. Blinded or motivated by imperial arrogance, the colonists missed the metaphor for international law, a metaphor that not only represented this opportunity to meet lawfully, but which had a potential to generate a very different constitution, a very different future for this country. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Wow, thank you. That that was fantastic. Um, really, so so three, I think, really terrific um, papers. And and at this point, I'd invite people to um, uh, make some indication to me. And I've already got some indication here from from Kevin about um, questions that you might want to ask, or just tell me that you want to ask a question, and we'll throw it open that way. But I'd like to take that this opportunity as as the chair to open the the discussion. Um, I suppose by saying that it, it seems to me that, that we've, we've heard really convincing papers here that um, colonies or colonial power is defined fundamentally through metaphor, through metaphors of space or synoptiki of resources, as, as Lorenzo said. And so we, we get this sense about how important, perhaps how necessary metaphor is to the colonial project. But also, I think some sense that it's a kind of a category error, error that there's something partial or impoverished about it. And I like Christine's phrase that that metaphor was perhaps eager to please. So I think the question that I want to ask is, um, this point of colonial power from from those who were the colonised subjects, the the colonised peoples rather than the the, the colonising peoples, was this power or legal relationships also understood metaphorically or was it was it not understood was was it understood in a very much more material or concrete way 
Um, and I don't know whether any of our, our panelists would like to um, respond to that question. Um, perhaps I thought that Shane's paper came closest to connecting with kind of colonised people's own metaphors of the colonial, colonial project rather than simply being the object of the metaphor by the colonisers. I would just say, I, in my project, it's a very difficult question to answer because I haven't spoken to any Wadawurrung people or any people of the Kulin Nation to sort of get, get a sense of how they read um, the material that I'm presenting. Um, there are no accounts of, that I've read yet of, uh, of their responses or reactions or how they were reading it. So, so basically, I don't, don't know the answer to that at all. Um, on one hand, it certainly would have been felt extremely materially what was going on, not at all, well, extremely literally, if you like, the land being taken, um, disease, death, and so on was, uh, couldn't be more material. Um, but metaphorically, in the sense that it was also an expression of colonial sovereignty, that that, that force that was being felt was, was a colonial force, was a sovereign force of a, of, of a group of people, perhaps. Um, but maybe Lorenzo or Christine have answers. No answer. Uh, I wish I knew more what um, what kind of you know structures um, inform the, the 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 conceptualization of indigenous um, um, sovereign orders. Um, um, uh, uh, many scholars have emphasized um, that there is an incommensurability, um, which is a denial of metaphor. Um, you know, of the very possibility of metaphor. Um, but, but Shane, I, I just wanted to point out that the, the, the very idea of separation, as in the creation of a, 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 of a new colony, it's a metaphor. It's not that they widened the river and they made the mountains bigger, right? <laughs> so nothing moved, there was no separation. It was just a, a, you know, um, a conceptualization itself, in itself. And so you have, a, a, you have a metaphor within a metaphor. You are, you know the procession is a, is 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 a metaphorical structure, and then uh, the very you know it's 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 performed for the purpose of celebrating a metaphor. No, precisely. I mean, sovereignty itself is of course a metaphor. The sovereign, you know, so the yeah, what sovereign? It's a metaphor for something else as well. So, no, I mean we're sort of caught in this web of metaphors. That's um, right. I, I really like this image. Um, um of course, um, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, we, we have this thing, yeah? Uh, Christianity, the Western uh, colonizing uh, 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 move, and, and that's what I did. Uh, but really, my old teacher in Hamburg always said the indigenous uh, 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 people are the main drivers. So in the Torah Strait, we have the coming of the light, yeah? And Christianity is not an external thing. It becomes really internal. And when we go to... Um, French-speaking West Africa, that's the church of Simon Kimbange, uh, uh, we can see that it becomes anti-colonial because Simon Kimbange says, well, to the colonizers, you're coming with the Bible, where have you fed the um, hungry, uh, cured the sick and raised the dead? Come on, on your bike and do it. And their metaphors uh, uh, and biblical language are becoming um, something you can hold the colonizers to account for example, yeah? So Christianity is a really funny thing. Uh, you can do a lot of things with, and certainly when uh, uh, Christianity hits uh, uh, the colonial spaces, uh, it becomes quite complex. Mm. Well, we, we have a, uh, Kevin, I wonder, wonder whether um, we could go to Kevin now, who has uh, a question of about, abstract, about, I think the difference between metaphor and metonymy is how I would characterize um, Kevin's question. Well, maybe going a bit further than that, uh, it's, I think thinking about the, the symbolic field that we're working in, and Lorenzo mentioned synecdoche in, say, a country like Brazil, for instance, has a slightly different uh, understanding or structure as, as metaphor. But uh, when thinking about colonization, uh, a lot of the metaphors or symbols are related to objects such as, obviously, the crown, uh, in terms of the, the sovereign territory, uh, the flag, the nation, uh, there is the Bible, uh, and clearly part of coloniality is creating spaces where these objects can be contained, whether it's a palace for a crown, uh, 
museums, libraries, and so on. Um, so there, and this, I guess, is about Shane's point that the union of people is necessarily abstract, uh, but I guess it is about the way in which part of coloniality is, is controlling the circulation of the objects that underpin those meanings, uh, like a kind of a hard currency for an economy. Uh, and um, I'm just thinking about whether this is, adds a new dimension or whether, whether it's a, a more incidental kind of element in terms of understanding coloniality, the objects that underpin these metaphors that give them a, a, a presence. So this is a this is a question about materiality, metaphor and materiality, and understanding the materiality as actually part of the metaphor rather than as simply the kind of the opposite um, of metaphor. Does any of our panel want to sort of uh, respond to that? So I don't. I think it's. I think it's great. So the way in which the material itself feeds back into create the metaphor. So it's not simply um, that the procession is a expression of sovereignty, but create sovereignty in a particular way is the point, I guess. So um, the way they, they mix, um, which I haven't actually, haven't thought about at all, but would be really important to think through the way in which uh, the relationship between the metaphor and the object, how they come together to create something. And um, so I think it's a really important point, which I'd have to think more about. Well, it, may, you know, it perhaps relates more to an imperial regime, which is more material based than you, you talk about the corporation. Mm. Maybe the, the only real material underpinning of the corporation is the board table, uh, which and the board itself, uh, mm. which begins, that obviously gives it a material presence mm. that is important. So how, I know many designers, for instance, working with Aboriginal people on how to create an appropriate board table for their corporation. Uh, was more than just an aesthetic, was highly symbolic. Um, and just whether the, the materials themselves can underpin and give value to those metaphors beyond the, um, the aesthetics or the logic. Yeah, and the banner, the banner was extremely important in, in the parade for uh, not just the Wadawurrung who were marching, but for all the groups who were marching. The banner was sort of the centerpiece, in fact. These massive banners, really elaborate banners as well. A lot of work going into them. Um, Absolutely, it's almost like they were the things, and then the people were just carrying the banner as the so the props. Mm. Um, I, I want to go now. I think I think to Warwick. Warwick's made really, uh, I think, an interesting point um, about what is at stake in the turn to metaphor, and it relates to I think the politics, the politics of metaphor, and the politics of thinking about what metaphors. So, Warwick, would you like to elaborate that? Well, I don't, uh, well, thanks, uh, Des. Uh, good to see uh, all of you again. Um, I don't think I need to elaborate. I, I think I've actually typed rather too much there, but, but uh, it may be an issue that was discussed uh, last week and I unfortunately missed that. But, uh, uh, but uh, and so, if so, just ignore it. But uh, um, really, I, I just wanted to ask what people on the panel and in the broader group thought might be at stake in a, in a, uh, an emphasis now on colonialism as metaphor, especially in view of uh, Tuck and Yang's uh, argument that decolonization is not a metaphor. And uh, when I read that article some years ago, I took that really to be an intervention to say, let's move this out of, in a sense, academic discussion and let's see what could, uh, how we could decolonize as an effective political strategy um, which actually benefited, as I said, Indigenous people. So, in a sense, it's a provocative question. I mean, what is at stake by returning to discussions of, of metaphor? <laughs> like, that's that, that's great. And um, uh, who who would like to have a? You know, I, I think this is a this is a really fundamental question. I think about whether you know, like. And, and really, this colonial panel was framed around around that idea, and and around of metaphor in relation to colonisation and what we thought about that. Lorenzo, what do you think? Yes, look, um, um, I've been thinking about this issue um, quite for quite some time. 
Um, and uh, and, and uh, the, when I read the intervention, the Tuck and Young intervention, I thought that what they were saying is that decolonization cannot be only a metaphor. And that's, um, that's a fair point, and that's, um, that's understandable. But, um, um, but, but then the, 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 the actual debate that followed um, it developed in a way that, uh, that basically said um, something different that, than the previous proposition. It said that uh, 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 a, a metaphor cannot be but a colonial uh, uh, structure. And then, um, and then I um, then I crafted my response and saying no that there is no reason why we should think that metaphor and decolonial decoloniality decolonial action should be should be should be mutually exclusive. We could uh, do one thing and the other simultaneously, and we, we you know we uh, um, so so um, yes and also. I wonder whether in their text they knew how um, uh, how much they were uh, um, um, uh, driven by by metaphorical structures in in the first place. Um, so I felt that the cat was out of the bag anyway. The metaphor was inbuilt in the discourse. And um, anyway. okay, uh, Melinda, you wanted to come in on that. Yeah, thanks, Des. Hi, everyone. Thanks for um, really fabulous presentations today. Very stimulating. Um, I, I, a little bit like Warwick, I suppose, I was very struck across these papers um, by the way in which it seems it's, it's easier for metaphors to consolidate existing forms of relation, domination, dispossession, and so on, rather than remake the world. And so I wondered if each of you, and I appreciate Shane has already started speaking to this a little bit um, and that you're still very early on in this research, but I wonder if each of you can um, have anything to say on this question of whether and how working with metaphors can help us get at the specificity of, of experience or work across difference. Say that last bit one more time. I said, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on whether working through the prism of metaphor, we can actually get at the specificity of experience rather than look to always um, work within the terms that affirm what we know. Mm -hmm. Um, perhaps there are two two levels that are at stake here. One is a, an ability to direct to recognize the operation of metaphor, um, and uh, and and this ability is, for example, uh, absolutely crucial in the critique of metaphors that have become structured and uh, and uh, and impediments to to, to 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 moving away from colonial relationships. So. The ability to recognize the operation of metaphor is something that we, we should retain and cherish and, um, and, um, and upskill ourselves in, uh, in, in detecting the operation and, 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 uh, and what follows from that. Um, the second point, uh, I am uh, more um, reluctant to, to embrace and uh, whether we can actually use actively metaphors for uh, for for crafting responses, um, so the, on, on the the first point, yes, we must be able to recognize metaphors in their operation. The second point, uh, uh, the jury is still out to use a metaphor. And, and part of the point, sorry, does you know, Shane, you first. Yeah, this is I think this is Lakoff and uh, um, Johnson. Johnson, yes. Uh, the importance of repetition with metaphor. So you can't just use a metaphor and recreate the world once, but it's through the ritual repetition of these metaphors to the point where they become elusive, where we don't even recognize them as metaphors, where they really begin to structure how you think and how the world uh, is understood and so on. So, so at that point, I mean, maybe it's developing rituals of metaphors and getting these repetitions that they can start doing that sort of work, but not just deploying a metaphor once off. Um, I, I suppose I, I'm slightly more, um, 
maybe more positive about it than 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 what has just been said. In in, in the sense that the the other thing I think that people like Lakov and Johnson made very forcefully was that we don't want to think of metaphors as being static. They're, they're not, they're not, they're, you know, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's right to think of a metaphor as the static imposition of a model on another world. It, it's a way in to learning something and, and the power of metaphor is the dynamic structure that it creates between, and so in other words, yes, a metaphor starts from the known in order to move to the unknown, but it doesn't stay simply with the known. And it, I think that it does allow, or it can allow a kind of a dynamic relationship where we, as we learn more about different kinds of experiences, we also learn more about what might be imminent or potential within the metaphor itself. So that the metaphor itself becomes uh, a possibility of growth and change rather than simply um, a static kind of enforcement of a pre-existing model. That, that's certainly what I think is valuable or important uh, about metaphor. I, so I like that's, that's why I'm slightly more sorry, Christine. I, I like that, that you just went to the metaphor of growth. Yeah. Yeah. As if growth is always what we need. Uh, maybe we need a sort of pruning. Um, Absolutely. But uh, that's what I, I, what I try to show is that metaphors uh, actually have inherent tradition and relationships in them and inbuilt. Yeah. And uh, the round table is a very different uh, exercise to uh, an, an altar that's uh, three spaces up and has a congregation in front of it. Uh, I, I thought a lot of my metaphors on, on Christianity and, and agriculture actually very spatial because uh, as you showed with the procession, the spatial is already a metaphor where we are put. Um, but nee, uh, uh, um, with metaphors, I think you, you put your experience in a narration that you share and you ascribe to relationships that are built in, in, in metaphors too, especially in those Christian ones. And, and that's, that's my profession in life is in a way uh, to untangle them, uh, open them up and, and say, hey, when you use this, this is what you're doing. Mm. So I do think that metaphors have a real impact, but m metaphors can be really uh, um, expressing very different relationships and, and open up very different futures. Mm. I think that's a great point. So in, in the paper at the end, so part of the issue was the the lack of relations between uh, colonists and indigenous peoples was reflected in the lack of metaphor like the missed metaphor was partly because there was the colonists were not engaging in um were not meeting were not sort of uh, meeting with the indigenous people um in that way so they they weren't relating in any way to the indigenous people other than by dispossessing them and so on um which also was reflected in this missed metaphor um this missed opportunity if you like So, so I've got a couple of couple of things, and I'm mindful of the time. Um, uh, Lewis wanted to come in on this point, so I'm, I might ask Lewis to say um, a few words about what he's what he's already written there, and then um, I want uh, Judy's got a question to ask. No, I just uh, <clears throat> so uh, I was thinking about uh, the third world and uh, the third world with the former colonies. And the term was coined by Alfred Sauvy in 1952, and it was meant to compare those former colonies to the third state in the French uh, Revolution, because for in Sauvy's uh, metaphor, it was like uh, the communist bloc was the clergy, uh, the, man, the, the NATO bloc was the aristocracy, and then the third world was going to move uh, uh, to change uh, the world, and yet, uh, the term became, uh, uh, through uh, across decades, uh, it became a derogatory term. So uh, to keep the metaphor just uh, as, as a critique or to uncover um, new meanings, perhaps uh, it is also a use of who, who it is also a, a, an issue of who appropriates uh, uh, the metaphor, who is, who is using mm. uh, the metaphor, if uh, it is just to keep uh, the world as it is, uh, or if you are, if, if, um, um, uh, uh, when the metaphor is alive in political sense, then uh, uh, it certainly can uh, assist us in, in building uh, new worlds 
as you are uh, suggesting, that's one of those uh, so we say, oh yes, these colonies are going are the third state. This is a, uh, and then you think about the former colonies in these terms. Said, of course, we would say then a, a new world can emerge from this, but when it is used in the other sense, oh, they are the uh, the ones that are left behind, the, the ones in the third place, then uh, uh, it's like uh, that, that new sense that was uh, originally uh, embedded in the term is, is lost depending on who is using it. Yeah, good. That's, that's very helpful. Uh, Judy. Hi, this is a question for Shane. Um, and it feeds into, I think, or crosses over with the previous discussion that we've just had. Um, I'm thinking about the metaphor of denial that that procession of the Wadarung Corporation may have represented in relation to Terra Nullius. Um, and it also relates to what Lorenzo was saying in a, mm -hmm. in a different way, because I was... I had never thought of that idea about um, the naming of the countries like the Ivory Coast and the Gold Coast and places like that as metaphor, um, colonial metaphors. Um, so there was a very material reality for, for First Nations people um, in the idea of terra nullius. Um, this was always going to be, a, this was going to be a prison colony at first. It wasn't initially a place where resources were going to be extracted. So I'm wondering whether you've got any thoughts about what I said before about the, that procession and the beginning of the, the incorporated bodies that are the only organisations that governments will now um, consult with and the idea of terra nullius. Mm. Thanks. Mm. It's a great, great point. So the way in which the procession of the Indigenous body under the banner of the Independent Order of Blackfellows, under the banner of this corporation, Friendly Society, how that might have worked to work against the metaphor of terra nullius, of this being an empty land. Is that what you're saying? How it was denying or how it was? I think it was den maybe denying it and avoiding, avoiding the awkwardness of it. Mm. But I don't think it worked against it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, I'd have to think, think about it. I think there was the, another thing that was, was interesting about how those, that community was represented is that, is that this, the, the bits that you quoted um, had a lot of emphasis on power, dignity. You know, it was quite an unusual description, wasn't it? Um, and, and I wondered what was at stake in this kind of communication of a kind of an, of an authority almost like a kind of force or terror that at the same time was being used used in this way. Yeah, there were plenty of very racist and uh, there was other language in the newspapers, which I didn't uh, repeat. Um, I didn't uh, include that in this, in this thing, but, but compared to just a year before or a year later, the sort of uh, um, ways in which the newspapers were reporting the Wadawurrung or other indigenous communities was, um, it was very different and maybe it was speaking to this sort of this moment of uh, this foundational moment the colony saw itself as um, emerging as a new a new colony a newborn nation a newborn colony as it called it so they as a, um, there was less of a threat maybe that they yeah. felt less threatened i don't know there was, there was something going on at that moment of, of celebration that that yeah. uh, maybe they were looking a bit differently than they yeah otherwise are. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and, and that's kind of interesting, isn't it? That idea that maybe there was this tiny little window of possibility that was then, you know, closed down for all sorts of other reasons. But mm. uh, it's interesting to think about. But it was only a, a permitted window. <laughs> it wasn't negotiations or, or talk. No, that's, that's right, yeah. With, with anybody else in the Aboriginal community, and that's happening again now with the situation on the Western Highway with the Japarong trees and the, the Jukun Caves and the, the fracking in the Northern Territory. All those nego negotiations have happened with those corporations mm. rather than with the wider communities, most of whom actually, who actually live in those areas. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
With regards to the linkages between Terranuleus and the synecdochal uh, 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 structures operating in how you name a country, how you name a colony, um, I think your intuition is, uh, is really productive. Um, it is uh, um, 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 a, a similar way of denial. Um, Terranuleus is premised on the, on the idea that um, the ties that the local people entertain with the land are most unlike the ties that would make it uh, um, uh, terra alicuris, terra of somebody, right? So it is a way of denying those ties and denying the people themselves. Um, with regards to, the, to, 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 to naming a colony for what it comes out of it, um, it is also a form of denial because all of a sudden, absolutely nothing exists beyond uh, 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 the commodity that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that represents the, the colony um, uh, uh, rather than that. So the, 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 the outcome of both processes is, uh, is, 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 is a form of denial and they both operate by way of, uh, of, um, of, of enabling a translation or disabling a translation. So in, in, the one, in one case, there is no translatability because the local people entertain ties that are not recognizable, therefore it's terra nullius. And in the other case, the other people simply don't exist, only the commodities. Um, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking as you say that about, you know, um, we wouldn't want to overstate the point, but you can think of a lot of ways in which settler colonies are named in terms of spatial representations rather than in terms of, of resource extraction. So, austral, um, New South Wales, New Zealand, you know, like I'm, I'm just wondering whether there's a more general point to make there. Absolutely. Um, you, we should also note that, um, uh, um, the, you know, um, settler colonies uh, uh, um, are, 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 um, are articulated in international networks of trade. They are not subsumed in international network of trade. That's one of the major differences. So they, they grow by reproducing, not by producing. Right. Uh, so um, if you were to, to, to boil down the distinction between one mode of domination over the other is that one is obsessed with production and the other is obsessed with reproduction. Great. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, um, I think I'm going to um, round it up at this point. I think we've had a really fantastic discussion and a really wonderful set of papers. Um, and I want to use this moment to thank the panel for their wonderful work. And remind everybody that uh, next week we move from colonial history to the colonial present uh, with another set of papers, including a paper by Sarah Maria Sorrentino, um, whose work on slavery uh, Lorenzo referred to and was bouncing off uh, in today's paper. So we continue our discussions uh, at, at next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Des. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Uh, thank you, Carlos. We can stop the recording at this point.